<laughs> Good to see everyone virtually today. Um, for those of you on the call that I don't know, I'm Phil Choi. Um, I'm the director of the uh, Assisted Ventilation Clinic and also the director of respiratory therapy. And today will be my final talk to the division um, as I will be leaving in a few weeks, uh, three weeks time. So as I was pre preparing for this talk, I realized um, that everything in here is really kind of the culmination of everything that I've learned, um, the research that we published uh, from this group. Uh, so I've really tried to pack quite a bit in here. Um, you know, this is a field that's kind of ever growing in terms of home ventilation. And so, you know, I realized even from the last time I gave a similar type of talk to the division, even my own approach has changed. So, um, yeah, so this is really um, just kind of ongoing development of what I'm learning, um, what I've learned from my own um, colleagues here, and really just what I've learned from patient care overall. Um, so I have one disclosure, and that is that I'm an advisor for an event company called Breas, um, but I will not be talking about their um, specific products. So I wanted to start with a case. This was actually a case that I saw in the ICU probably last fall or so. Um, and again, even just taking care of uh, this guy taught me a lot about um, just how we have to approach the field in general. So this was a 63-year-old male who presented with acute hypoxic and hypercapnic respiratory failure requiring intubation. His initial ABG in the uh, ER was pH of 7.26, a PCO2 of 94, and a PAO2 of 89. So he was intubated and brought up to the CCMU, and after intubation, his ventilation pretty quickly improved. And uh, to the point, I think he was only intubated for a day or two, uh, to the point where his uh, ABG prior to extubation showed a pH of 7.43, a PCO2 of 52, and a PAO2 of 68. So he got extubated. Uh, he did fine on his SBT. And then uh, he had an A-line in, actually, so we were able to get pretty frequent gases. Uh, hours after extubation, his ABG showed a pH of 7.37, a PCO2 of 66, and a PAO2 of 91. So in terms of his past medical history, he rarely went to the doctor, but his wife said he was kind of declining from a respiratory standpoint over the course of months. He did have underlying AFib and was on Eliquis. And it beca because he had so many of these respiratory symptoms, I think they thought a lot of this was due to his AFib. And so he was referred to um, EP for ablation. He has a BMI of 37. He, ha he has a 60-pack year smoking history, but no spirometry that he's ever had. And uh, clinical OSA, according to his wife, but no formal sleep study was performed. So I'm going to pose a question to everyone. So what are the next steps after extubation? You know, if I had everyone's camera on, then people could just raise their hands. But um, I'll just use this as um, kind of a rhetorical response, I guess. So, you know, think about what you would, how you might approach this um, in your mind, at least, and we can have discussion later. So A would be to do nothing as pH is normal, so there's nothing to do. So I'm hoping that after all the talks that I've given to the division, um, particularly with some of the research that we've performed, that no one would uh, raise their hand for this. B would be to order an inpatient sleep study, and we know that uh, inpatient sleep studies can be very hard to get. C, order an outpatient sleep study. D, start BiPAP at 10 over 5, and so why do I pick 10 over five, because that seems to be what we default put everyone on if they're started on BiPAP. And then E would be to start NIV with appropriate mode settings and hours of usage to improve ventilation. So, you know, obviously I'm kind of leading everyone to think that E is the right answer, but I'm hoping at the end of the talk that everyone would kind of um, have a different approach to dealing with patients with chronic respiratory failure. Um, and hopefully it'll feel a little bit less like a black box when it comes to uh, general pulmonary care. So really the goals of this lecture are that I want everyone to recognize hypercapnic respiratory failure as a condition with high mortality, to understand the importance of CO2 reduction in the management of chronic respiratory failure, to understand different modes of non-invasive ventilation, understand the difference between respiratory assist devices and home ventilators, and be more familiar on how to initiate NIV for patients with hypercapnic respiratory failure, whether this is in the ICU or on pulmonary consults. And so many of you who have been to uh, Matt Wilson's research talk or some of the other talks that I've given um, are familiar with this paper that we published in the Annals of the American Thoracic Society a few years ago. 
And so uh, this was really looking at this idea of compensated hypercapnia and whether these patients were at more, more at risk um, and had uh, higher mortality, because I think there's been this um, general sense that if your pH is normal, that there's actually nothing to do. And these patients are, this is just where they live and they're doing fine. And so we really wanted to see whether or not that was true. And so we performed a uh, retrospective study looking at all patients at Michigan Medicine during the calendar year of 2018. Our inclusion criteria was any patient who was greater than 18 years old uh, had an admission during that year and had an ABG uh, with a normal pH of 7.35 to 7.45 and a P PCO2 of greater than 50. We excluded anyone who was younger than 18 years who only had BBGs, was admitted to psych or PM&R, um, or came from outside hospitals. And we've had 491 unique patients in the cohort. And so we really wanted to look at demographics, comorbid conditions, BMI, ABG levels. Uh, we looked at their bicarbonate levels on uh, the day of the ABG, uh, looked to see if they had spirometry. And then uh, we really wanted to see if they had any outpatient NIV use, although we did not look at compliance. And so uh, these are just some of the statistics uh, or just some of the characteristics of these patients. Um, I'm going to pass over this quickly because I have a lot of slides to get through. Um, but what you, what you can see here is that we broke up the groups into uh, different PCO2 levels, uh, 50 to 54.9, 55 to 64.9, and then greater than 65. So one of the things that we found was that um, in terms of outpatient ventilation, only 25% of the patients were prescribed outpatient NIV, but as you can see in this very bottom uh, line here, that once the PCO2 got um, more to the extremes, that NIV was more readily uh, prescribed as an outpatient. So maybe this recognition that if you're very hypercapnic, you're very sick, um, that we're recognizing NIV as a potential treatment modality. And so we had... Uh, out of these 491 patients, there were 1,141 inpatient admissions with 44% of the patients having two or more admissions. So obviously high utilizers of the healthcare system. Uh, the median number of ICU or hospital and ICU days were 21 and seven respectively. Uh, almost, almost two thirds of the patients had developed respiratory failure requiring invasive mechanical ventilation. And as I mentioned, only 25% of the patients were prescribed outpatient NIV. And so these are our Kaplan-Meier survival curves looking at, um, again, when we adjusted for age, sex, BMI, and Charleston comor comorbidity index, looking at mortality over the follow-up period um, for different groups of PCO2 and clearly showing that the greater the PCO2, the higher the mortality during that follow-up period. And this just showed that in this multivariable Cox regression model that um, PCO2 was an independent risk factor for mortality. And this is again, after adjusted, being adjusted for age, sex, BMI, and Charleston comorbidity index. And so, you know, this, these data really showed um, that again, even if a pH is normal, the higher the PCO2, um, the worse the outcomes are. And so we looked into the literature to, sh you know, to try to explain why this might be the case. And so there is some uh, basic science data that looks at host defenses. Uh, so this group in Northwestern has really looked at whether PCO2 or CO2 in general has effects on host defenses. And they did this interesting study where they exposed uh, mice to uh, high CO2 levels for different amounts of time. And as you can see, as they were uh, exposed to CO2 for a greater number of days, the kidneys have the opportunity to compensate and the pH more normalizes. And when they looked at um, survival after being infected with pseudomonas, they found that um, the pre and post infection um, high CO2 uh, mice died at similar frequencies as the ones who were exposed to CO2 only post-infection. So this idea that, um, you know, even if your pH kind of normalizes, CO2 has effects um, on mortality, and this was thought to be due to neutroph neutrophil function um, in the setting of pseudomonas uh, infection. So as we were publishing um, our paper, this paper came out in the Blue Journal which was done by Gattinoni's group. And what they really looked at was CO2 storage in the body. And so in order to understand this um, pig study, it's really important to understand 
that CO2 is not only in the blood. So when we're just, uh, when we're getting an ABG, we're actually just measuring the PCO2 in the blood. But as CO2 kind of um, builds up in the body, there are fast compartments like the blood where it can go in and out very quickly. And then slow compartments like bone where it kind of diffuses and gets stored as bicarbonate. Um, and this happens at different rates. And so what they did was they actually uh, had different, uh, they had different pigs that were exposed to different uh, ventilation strategies. So pigs were either hyperventilated, hypoventilated, um, hypoventilated, and then um, returned to normal ventilation or hypoventilated. And then um, give, they were given extracorporeal CO2 removal, which is essentially respiratory dialysis. And the important figure to note here is this uh, figure A, which shows that um, in this last 60 minutes where all the pigs were hypoventilated, most of the curves, um, the PCO2 actually rises, but then kind of stabilizes, which shows um, that, you know, essentially the CO2 in the blood is starting to diffuse into other compartments. So it doesn't just linearly go up. But in this top group, which is the um, group of pigs that were hypoventilated throughout the whole study period, you can see that PCO2 starts at a higher level and to continues to rise in this final setting of hypoventilation, really signifying that at that point, body stores of uh, CO2 are a little bit saturated. And so uh, CO2 levels in the blood rise more rapidly, which will um, not allow the kidneys time to actually compensate and keep your pH relatively normal, which is one of the reasons why we argue that mortality is high um, in, the, in patients with compensated hypercapnia because body stores of CO2 um, just increase over time. And then in any kind of situation when ventilation changes or maybe CO2 production increases, that the body can't actually compensate for that. And you become acidotic and uh, again, high, higher risk for acute events. And so, you know, we believe um, that non-invasive ventilation is actually a treatment that not only maintains CO2 levels, but actually should be, um, should be used to actually reduce CO2 levels. And so there's actually a precedent for this. So for non-invasive ventilation and severe stable COPD, in 2014, in Lancet Respiratory Medicine, there was a randomized control trial um, of gold force uh, COPD patients with normal pH and baseline hypercapnia, which showed that there was an overall one-year mortality difference in patients who are on NIV versus not. The key thing um, that I believe is really important to note about this study is actually that it's not just that they were prescribed NIV, but it's actually that their NIV strategies were, um, were really to reduce the baseline PCO2 by 20% um, or get it to less than 48 millimeters of mercury. And so this next slide shows that they were able to accomplish this. So this is in kilopascals, but um, the baseline PCO2 in both groups was probably around uh, 60 millimeters of mercury. And in the NIV group, they were able to reduce it to 6.5, which I believe is in the high 40s or so. And so again, when we look at studies um, and just focus on the mortality and the treatment, but miss the idea that they were actually reducing PCO2 with NIV, then I think we miss a key detail in, um, in the study uh, and why it's so important to think about um, following NIV um, and PCO2 um, as we're longitudinally following these patients. And so this is something that we do in the assisted ventilation clinic. We use transcutaneous CO2 to do spot checks for every single patient at every single visit. And so after we published the study in the annals of the American Thoracic Society, we really wanted to see what was happening to our patients in the assisted ventilation clinic. And so because we have all the CO2 data, we were able to perform a retrospective study looking at CO2 trends in our patient population who were referred to us with hypercapnia and see what overall mortality was. And so we did this retrospective review of all the patients in the ABC with baseline hypercapnia we recorded trends in PCO2 over six to 12 months um, follow-up period. And we looked at two-year mortality um, and hospitalizations at Miss Michigan Medicine uh, adjusted for diagnosis, baseline PCO2, BMI, age, race, and Charleston comorbidity index. And so this was done by uh, Victor Jimenez, uh, 
who was a research fellow with Bob Heise um, a couple years ago and is now a second year resident at uh, Yale University. And so what we found was that when we broke up the, um, the CO2 categories into achieving a PCO2 of great, less than 50 or greater than 50, we found that for the group that was able to achieve a PCO2 of less than 50 during the follow-up periods, that mortality um, was much less than th those um, patients who were unable to achieve that PCO2 of uh, less than 50. And I think you can also see from uh, these numbers at risk that we were actually able to achieve a PCO2 of less than 50 in a majority of our patients. And this was a similar type of analysis, but basically broken up into percent decrease of PCO2 from their baseline, showing that um, the greater the decrease from their baseline, the improved survival. And so again, if you have someone who um, has a PCO2 of 80 at baseline, maybe we can't get it down to 50, but if we can reduce their PCO2 to the greatest degree that their survival improves. And so we just published this in respiratory care uh, maybe about four or five months ago. And this was really what we were trying to say is an important part of NIV management, that it's actually the reduction in PCO2, not NIV alone, that's uh, the important um, piece of care. And so again, a lot of these patients um, who were not able to decrease their PCO2, you know, they were still on NIV, but either they were completely non-compliant, or maybe it was just that they were not using NIV long enough, um, or really maybe their disease severity was just so so severe that it was really challenging without tracheostomy to actually reduce their CO2. So these are uh, we've made the argument in the paper that you know, if you're unable to reduce CO2 despite making all the adjustments that you can on NIV, this may help um, either with end-of-life care planning or decisions regarding tracheostomy. And so, you know, I think everyone in the audience at least recognizes that NIV is really an important piece of care for, um, for patients with hypercapnic respiratory failure. But then the big question becomes, how do we do this in practice, um, particularly if it's not something that you're doing day in and day out? And so this next part of the talk is really um, geared towards giving you some of the tools to be able to approach uh, patients on consults or in the ICU and feel like you have at least um, the baseline understanding and the baseline tools to be able to at least start the process. And so... I'm going to go back to the taxonomy of mechanical ventilation that I talked about a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about the inpatient vents, because I think, um, you know, a lot of times what I find is that when we're talking about non-invasive ventilation, kind of rush to all these acronyms like ABAPS, um, but I think it's really helpful to take a few steps back and actually think about just um, non-invasive ventilation as just being pressure modes of ventilation only instead of having an ET tube in, you use a mask interface. And so in order to understand uh, non-invasive ventilation, particularly these days where modes have become much more complex, it's really important to think back on just the fundamentals um, when we talk about trigger, limiter target, um, and cycle. So again, as a refresher, the trigger is what initiates the breath. Is it machine uh, triggered, which is based on your timer or your backup rate? or is it patient-triggered, which is based on patient effort? The easy thing about non-invasive ventilation is that the limit is um, always going to be pressure. You know, we're talking about pressure modes of ventilation. And then the cycle, because um, we are not dealing with true volume modes in uh, non-invasive ventilation, what we're doing is basically uh, simplifying the cycling to either time, um, where we set the inspiratory time, or flow, which is a percentage of the peak flow rate for that breath. And so really it's um, when we talk about the breath types that I mentioned in my lecture a couple of weeks ago, we're really looking at these breath types that are either gonna be machine or patient triggered, uh, pressure target or a time or flow cycle. So again, kind of just simplifies everything a little bit. And so what ends up becoming important is understanding what modes there are in non-invasive ventilation and what modes we should be using for different types of scenarios. And so non-invasive modes, um, you know, different modes are uh, preferred for different indications. 
And again, understanding those basic breath types will help you understand which mode to use um, in which situation, depending on their underlying pathophysiology. So I'm going to go through a few of the main modes, um, kind of step by step, and talk about the different indications. So BiPAP spontaneous, really, that's kind of historically what we thought about BiPAP as being. This is really just BiPAP without a backup rate. So you set an inspiratory pressure and expiratory pressure. All the breaths are flow cycled. Um, there's no backup rate set. And really, when we think about indications for this, the main indication is going to be obstructive sleep apnea for patients who cannot tolerate CPAP or CPAP is not adequate to control their uh, obstructive sleep apnea. But in the algorithm for non-invasive ventilation for COPD, it also becomes kind of the first step in terms of uh, getting machines for a COPD patient with hypercapnia. So once we start thinking about inpatient uh, non-invasive ventilation, really our default oftentimes is gonna be this BiPAP ST, and that stands for spontaneous time. As I'm working with the residents and the fellows, you know, I, I first talk about the name and then have people think through what this machine actually does based on the name, because then it becomes a little bit more um, intuitive. So, you know, BiPAP ST is really BiPAP with a backup rate. So you're setting your inspiratory pressure, you're setting your expiratory pressure, you set a backup rate, an inspiratory time, uh, you set a rise. And so this is just how fast the breath goes from EPAP to IPAP on our invasive um, dragers. This is called slope. Um, and then you're also setting a cycle sensitivity. So this is important, again, as you're thinking about um, what the breath does when. So at the backup rate, the breaths are time cycled. So that inspiratory time um, is actually delivered if the backup rate kicks in. If the patient is breathing above the backup rate, then the breaths are flow cycled and the breath will terminate based on that cycle sensitivity that you set. So the default generally is about 20 or 25 percent of the peak flow rate, but that can be adjusted depending on uh, what you want to achieve. So again, I, I think I mentioned a mode on the new Hamiltons that actually functions like this BiPAP ST that the breaths when you um, when you actually uh, when the patient triggers the breath will be flow cycled. Um, but again, that inspiratory time is only going to be when the backup rate kicks in. So this can function essentially like a spontaneous BiPAP mode if the patient is 100% of the time breathing over the backup rate. So over time, the pressure, um, the non-invasive ventilation modes have really become more sophisticated to really be and act like ventilators. Um, so there's a pressure control mode of BiPAP where, you, where the settings seem very, very similar to the previous ST modes. You set an inspiratory pressure, you set an expiratory pressure, you set a backup rate, an inspiratory time, and a rise. So the thing that's missing here is that cycle sensitivity. And so in this mode, all the breaths are time cycled, whether the patient's triggering or if the machine is triggering. So this really is same as um, PCAC on invasive ventilators. And actually on the new trilogy EVOs, the white trilogies, it's actually called PCAC. So Again, really important to note the difference between ST and PC because, again, there's pros and cons to both. So AVAPs, you know, is something that we kind of throw around a lot. Um, it's called Average Volume Assured Pressure Support. It's a proprietary algorithm for Philips Respironics ventilators. So for our non-invasive ventilators, our BiPAP machines, generally in this hospital, we use uh, Respironics devices which is one reason why we've um, become so accustomed to AVAPs. But again, this is a specific mode to the Philips uh, Respironics ventilators. And so this, uh, what this most mode does is it adjusts inspiratory pressure to average a specific target volume. So if you set the volume of 400, what the machine is gonna do is auto adjust the inspiratory pressure in order to maintain that average volume. So this is similar to PRVC or VCAC auto flow but the changes occur slower. So it's not breath to breath. The volumes are actually averaged over a minute as opposed to every few breaths. So on the Trilogy um, 100s, the Trilogy Evos and the B30s, uh, AVAPS is actually a feature that is added onto other modes. So you first decide whether you want an ST mode 
or a pressure control mode, and then you add AVAPs on top of that. Whereas on the V60s, which is our larger uh, non-invasive vents, uh, AVAPs is only available in an ST mode. And so these are some of the devices that we use here in the hospital at Michigan Medicine. The Philips V30 is um, you know, pretty um, small. It's gonna be table side, but it really does have these advanced modes. The V60 is probably the main one that we see in the ICU for acute non-invasive ventilation. And then again, there's a the Trilogy uh, 100 and the Trilogy Evo. We're trying to replace um, all of the Trilogy 100s, the blue trilogies with these newer Evo models. So when we set AVAPs, uh, we're not setting a fixed um, inspiratory pressure uh, because it's adjustable. So we set a target volume. Oftentimes we'll start at about six to eight cc's per kg, but I'll talk about this a little bit later where really we don't want to think about um, one arbitrary setting as being able to fit the patient's ventilation needs. We set the EPAP and because the IPAP is adjustable, we set an inspiratory pressure minimum and maximum. And these are fixed minimums and maximums, so the ventilator cannot actually go beyond these limits. So you technically, if you set the minimum very high, you can overbreathe your tidal volume, whereas if you um, set your max very low, you may not actually reach that tidal volume. The, you set the breath rate, the eye time, the rise. The AVAPS rate is just how large a pressure change the machine will make at any given time, but that's one of the settings that you'll find. And so the benefits of AVAPS, I really want to kind of hammer home this idea that AVAPS isn't better than BiPAP. Um, if you set AVAPS inappropriately, you may actually underventilate compared to someone who's on fixed by level. It's like saying, um, you know, PRVC is better than, you know, PCAC. There are pros and cons to both, and we just really have to know how to use these modes appropriately. So the benefits are that you can maintain a consistent minute ventilation through the night. So based on the cycle of sleep that you're in or the position that you're in, your chest wall uh, compliance may change. And so what it can do is maintain that minute ventilation by adjusting the pressures accordingly um, as changes are happening in real time. One of the biggest reasons why we like using AVAPS is because you know I deal with a lot of patients with ALS. And so as the disease is progressing, while I could put someone on fixed BiPAP and then just check the downloads periodically, sometimes you might miss big changes in disease where if you're on fixed bi-level modes, then what happens is um, the tidal volume delivery will go down. So either the patient has to breathe faster or you may hypoventilate um, and lead to hypercapnia. Um, there's also this benefit that if the settings are appropriate, then it may be comfortable than it may be more comfortable than fixed by level um, as the patient's awake and able to put in more effort, then it starts at a lower pressure, but then as the patient falls asleep, it can gradually get up. Um, but in terms of AVAPs being better, that's just a, not quite the right way to think about it. We want, we, want, we want to make sure that we can deliver adequate minute ventilation regardless of what mode we're using. And I think sometimes if we're just thinking about AVAPs as a better mode, and not thinking about what settings they need to be on, um, we're just not thinking about it in the right way. AVAPS AE is probably a mode that some of you may encounter, whether you see patients on AD or in the ICU, but it's um, a mode that I'm starting to use a little bit more um, for various reasons. Part of it becomes um, you know, somewhat insurance related, but this is a, uh, a mode specific to the trilogy but all the ventilators do have this auto EPAP um, with uh, volume targeted modes. So essentially what it is, it's like having an auto CPAP where the EPAP adjusts to treat sleep apnea based on different algorithms. And then uh, on top of that, you have your standard AVAPs. And so uh, the, the, the big difference is that you set an EPAP min and max. So again, the EPAP will adjust <clears throat> depending on how sleep apnea changes through the night. And then because you don't have a fixed EPAP, you have to um, have a delta pressure, so a pressure support min and max, and then the rest are the same, the tidal volume, the breath rate, the eye time, the rise. And so as we're starting to think about patients, um, you know, that we're starting on non-invasive ventilation, one of the big things to think about first is um, whether or not, assuming that you're going to put them in an AVAPS mode, 
whether you really want to start with a pressure control mode or an ST mode. So the big question start to ask yourself, when would either of the modes be preferred? Um, and then what are the dangers or the pitfalls of using certain modes? And so again, as we kind of put them side by side, um, PC versus ST and PC modes, the, all the breaths are time cycled. Whereas in ST, you have a mix of time cycled and flow cycled breaths, depending on how much the patient is triggering. So the benefit of PC modes is that you have more controlled ventilation by setting that inspiratory time. Whereas in ST modes, you may um, end up having, you know, this variable eye time that's dependent on the amount of flow that's delivered for each breath can potentially lead to this um, rapid shallow breathing pattern, particularly for the very severe neuromuscular patients. So if they just don't have enough strength to generate a lot of flow, um, you're uh, your inspiratory, the natural inspiratory time for each breath may actually be so short that they can't actually deliver adequate tidal volumes. Whereas in PC modes, um, again, think about this idea of having a fixed eye time that can be extremely uncomfortable for some patients, particularly if the eye time isn't really set appropriately. Whereas um, spontaneous breaths in ST modes might be more comfortable because you have this variable inspiratory time. So as you're thinking about that initial decision as to whether to put them in an ST mode or a PC mode, really start thinking about, again, what's the underlying pathophysiology and what are the pitfalls if I put them in one or the other? So on the Trilogy Evo, um, one of the things to, um, to really keep in mind, particularly for those of you who are on um, AD is to note that the convention changes on the on these devices. So it used to be that in any AVAPS mode, you set the inspiratory pressure min and max. So this was like standard by level. So that IPAP is your peak inspiratory pressure. So what's changed on the Trilogy Evo, which we now have quite a bit of um, in our uh, ICUs and on AD, if you're in a pressure control mode, you're actually setting the delta pressure. And then if you're in the ST mode, um, you're actually still setting that IPAP min and max. And this has actually led to a few um, kind of safety events, uh, risk reports that we've had to write up because um, this has been something that, uh, you know, was a relatively new change when they switched to the Evo. But again, if you think about, particularly when you have double digit EPAPs, the difference between a delta pressure and an IPAP may be, you know, it, it may be clinically very different. Whereas if you have an EPAP of four, um, probably the difference isn't going to be that big. But something to keep in mind as you're thinking about vent settings, uh, thinking about discharges, um, just try to keep in mind um, whether it's going to be the pressure, um, delta, delta pressure that you're setting or a fixed IPAP min and max. So now I'm going to move a little bit. So I guess, first of all, does anyone have any questions about the modes of ventilation? I know I'm going relatively quickly. If not, you can ask questions at the end as well. So again, part of um, seeing a consult or seeing these patients on 8D where you want to start non-invasive ventilation is really understanding the indications for non-invasive ventilation first because this will make um, just the process of discharging patients a lot easier. Um, as soon as you put in a wrong code, um, you know, just get sent back from the DME company very quickly. And that can, you know, delay discharge by several days sometimes. Um, so if you know these criteria, um, or at least know where to look for them, then it, it just makes everything a lot smoother, um, particularly in terms of just um, having you know, just fewer things sent back to you. So the main indications for chronic non-invasive ventilation use are going to be neuromuscular disease, restrictive thoracic disorders um, like kyph kyphoscoliosis, COPD with hypercapnia, obesity, hypoventilation syndrome. I put uh, complex sleep apnea in parentheses mainly just because that's not something that we deal with. It's usually going to go to sleep. And so many of you have probably seen this either in the workroom in Taubman or on 8D, but there are very strict criteria for these devices called respiratory assist devices. So this is a very arbitrary CMS de designation. So essentially what, this, what these respiratory assist devices are, are 
BiPAPs with or without a backup brain. So AVAPS modes um, can be found on these respiratory assist devices. Um, so even if you're using AVAPS, um, you have to determine whether or not you actually want to prescribe these respiratory assist devices or another device called a ventilator, which I'll talk to you in a little bit. Um, and they have these CMS codes called E0470, which is uh, without a backup rate, and E0471, which is um, BiPAP with a backup rate. So ventilators, on the other hand, um, these are more advanced machines that have different features. So again, when we talk about something like a, a VAPS mode, like an AVAPS, um, these are not exclusively found on the ventilators. These can also be seen on the respiratory assist devices. So it's important to understand what features are on these ventilators so that you know when to prescribe them. So there's that adjustable EPAP mode, which is not found on the respiratory assist devices. So if you're wanting to prescribe an AVAPS AE, that is, um, you know, that's going to be, that's going to necessitate um, prescribing a ventilator. There's some, something called mouthpiece ventilation for daytime use. Uh, these machines also are, they're considered life support devices. So they have internal and external batteries for better mobility, but also for emergency situations. And these are coded differently than the respiratory assist devices. Um, these codes are E0466. And so the insurance qualification and also follow-up is um, actually different between these two devices. So just a note on mouthpiece ventilation, this is on-demand support with either a set volume or a set pressure. The expiratory pressure is set to zero. The breath rate can be set to zero as well. So this means that basically all the breaths can be patient triggered. And this can um, improve quality of life by liberating patients from masks. This makes eating and speaking easier. So many of our patients, this is one of our patients with muscular dystrophy. Many of these patients can use a mask for nighttime use with you know, our standards, standard um, bi-level or AVAP settings uh, at night, and then during the day, use this as needed, um, you know, really needing 24-7 ventila ventilation, but again, using this for on-demand support as opposed to uh, continuous support by mask. So when we're thinking about those specific respiratory assist devices, uh, Medicare has very strict criteria of how you get these, um, these devices for a patient. So it's always easiest to be able to qualify them under the neuromuscular or thoracic cage abnormality pathway. Really, for most of our patients, we're able to get this based on a forced vital capacity of less than 50% predicted. So in the clinic, we'll oftentimes do supine spirometry to see if that drops them below 50%. Uh, a maximum inspiratory pressure of less than negative 60 so again, if we do the MIP in the supine position, oftentimes we'll send them send that data to the DME companies. And you know, for anyone who's worked with me who has asked questions about the maximum inspiratory pressure, it's very effort dependent. So we really just do it not so much as an indicator of um, respiratory failure, but it's really about insurance qualification for these respiratory assist devices. If you're on the inpatient side and the patient has hypercapnia with a PCO2 of greater than 45 and they have a diagnosis of neuromuscular disease, then that alone will qualify them. So you don't need these other tests. You can do overnight oximetry and find uh, P, um, an SpO2 of less than 88% for greater than five minutes cumulative. Um, and again, PFTs can be performed in the supine position. So again, you only need one of these. So if you've met any of these criteria and you can somehow call them a neuromuscular condition, including um, I've used critical illness myopathy as um, diagnosis for patients who have been in the ICU for a long time, think about trying to use this criteria if possible, just because it becomes the least complex um, and usually you'll get things um, approved very quickly. COPD ends up becoming a lot trickier. So we see a lot of these patients with COPD um, with PCO2s of greater than 52. The problem is that the, um, the criteria are very outdated. Sorry, there is a typo on this. This is supposed to be a sleep oximetry of less than 88% for at least five minutes on two liters or higher. And so this is in addition to your P, um, PCO2 of greater than 52 and you have to rule out sleep, sleep apnea. So this does not need a formal sleep study. You just have to clinically determine that sleep apnea is not um, the cause of the hypoxemia. 
And then if you want to get a BiPAP without with a backup rate, you have to show that they're still hypercapnic while using BiPAP without a backup rate. So again, for a lot of these patients who are um, hypercapnic in the ICU, a lot of times it's actually difficult to meet these criteria, mainly because you can, hype, you can have hypercapnia without desaturating at night. Hypoventilation syndromes become even trickier. They require an ABG um, increase of greater than seven millimeters of mercury. You know, we've used a bunch of transcutaneous CO2 in the sleep lab. Uh, it's a little bit hard to determine whether or not they'll oftentimes, you know, there's no, no strict criteria for transcutaneous CO2 for these, um, for these Medicare criteria for hypoventilation syndrome. So again, this becomes increasingly difficult to try to, you know, meet all these criteria, particularly doing blood gases, you know, during sleep or immediately after sleep uh, just becomes a little bit cumbersome. And so because these become so tricky to get patients with COPD or hypoventilation, these respiratory cyst devices, oftentimes we are really um, kind of cornered into getting these more expensive ventilators for these patients. So in order to get a ventilator, you have to diagnose that they have a life-threatening disease. And I would say that if someone is hypercapnic, based on the um, data that we've published, that I would say that it is life-threatening if your you know, two-year mortality with PCO2 of 60 might be up to 60%. Um, and then you have to document why a RAD is not appropriate. So, you know, it's really only, you know, it's any of the reasons um, that you might require a ventilator, um, any of the features that are found on the ventilator that are not found on the respiratory assist devices. So you can document that they need it for daytime use, uh, you can document that they need mouthpiece ventilation, that they need um, mobility with a wheelchair. Sometimes just putting in persistent hypercapnia despite BiPAP is at least something that you can put in your note. Uh, the inspiratory pressures above 30 centimeters of water pressure. Um, so that's the limit on the respiratory assist devices. So if someone is morbidly obese and needs inspiratory pressures of 35 and they can tolerate that, they may necessitate a ventilator. Uh, and again, the auto EPAP mode on um, AVAPS is, again, one of those modes that's only found on, um, on the mechanical ventilators. And so oftentimes, I might start with that mode when there's any question as to whether or not uh, the ventilator will be approved. And so as you're seeing these patients either on consults or in the ICU, I think there's a few questions to ask. One is, do they have an indication for NIV based on, you know, either... PCO2 or just underlying conditions, what mode would best serve the ventilation needs? So would, would they be better off in a PC mode or an ST mode? Um, what are the goals of ventilation? What device would they most benefit from? But then again, one of the questions that we have to ask ourselves is what device can we actually get for them? Can I get them a respiratory assist device if they only need it for nighttime use, or is it going to be near impossible um, to get them a rad, in which case do they need a ventilator? And then again, it's important to document appropriately to get them device the device because that can be a big holdup if, um, and again, these are not clinical people who are proving this. So if you say they're doing well on BiPAP, then they're gonna send it back to you and say, well, you know, if they're doing well on BiPAP, why are you, why are you ordering a trilogy? And so again, these are some of the frustrating things about this field is that it's so nuanced um, but at least getting into the habit of understanding um, some of these like simple documentation type phrases that you can use will just help speed up discharges. So I think some of the challenges um, when you're seeing a patient uh, either on consults or in the ICU is most patients do not fit into one single box. You know, they may have COPD, but maybe it's really neuromuscular weakness that are driving things. The RAD criteria, criteria are extremely limiting. Um, so oftentimes there's no choice but to obtain, um, you know, a more expensive device, um, just because again, the RAD criteria are so, um, uh, so constricting, particularly for like the hypoventilation syndromes and COPD. So ventilators are oftentimes easier to get as long as you document appropriately, but, you know, we also want to think about costs. So ventilators are more expensive. 
um, they're indefinite monthly um, rentals, whereas RADs are fixed payments for 13 months. So sometimes this does actually become cost prohibitive for patients if they're prescribed a ventilator. But we also want to think overall about the healthcare system in general, because there's been this great increase in ventilator uh, prescriptions nationally. And I think a lot of that is driven by DME companies really um, getting more money for these uh, ventilators. So while sometimes there's no choice around it, we really want to make sure that if we can, if there's no other choice and we get them a ventilator, but there, if there, if there is potentially a cheaper option that would serve their needs, then we want to consider whether that might be um, the next best approach. And so some questions to ask are, um, you know, because oftentimes I get the question, oh, should we start this inpatient or can they just follow up as an outpatient? So I think, again, a general question to ask yourself would be, do, you, do I think that there's um, a good chance either this patient would die or be readmitted or go back to the ICU if NIV is not initiated relatively quickly? So if the answer to yourself is yes, then, you know, I think it's most important to start NIV um, in the hospital. And if the answer is yes, then most likely the patient should be moved to moderate care because um, that's really where true titration can happen. And so as you're thinking about starting these patients, whether it's on AD or on the consult service, maybe they're already in another ICU, you know, this is where my approach has actually changed over the years as I've seen more and more patients in the ICU. So, you know, we previously would, you know, kind of recommend AVAP settings the same way that we would in um, the clinic. But one thing that I realized is that for these patients, it's really important to understand um, what their ventilation needs are and what our goals are. So as I mentioned, like our goal in the clinic is to gradually decrease their PCO2. So that doesn't have to happen immediately, you know, overnight, but what we're trying to do is flush out their CO2 stores. Um, and so I actually have found that it's much easier to begin with fixed bi-level settings rather than VAPs because, you know, when you're starting with fixed bi-level, you know exactly what inspiratory pressure and what expiratory pressure they're getting. Whereas, whereas if you're in a VAPS mode, really, you have to be looking at the ventilator itself to know what the tidal volume delivery is. Just because you set a tidal volume of 400 doesn't mean that that's actually going to be delivered. And you don't, and you really want to do, you want to keep track of what inspiratory pressures are required to deliver certain tidal volumes. So the next is really to choose the mode. So think about whether you would want to start someone in ST mode versus PC. And again, this is really related to underlying pathophysiology. Then you really want to set the settings uh, to provide adequate tidal volume given the underlying pathophysiology. For example, a patient with neuromuscular weakness may not need more than an inspiratory pressure of, say, high teens or low 20s to uh, deliver the tidal volume that would reduce their PCO2. But if a patient has severe kyphoscoliosis, oftentimes you know, even inspiratory pressures of 30 may not be adequate. And so really think about what's their underlying lung mechanics or chest wall mechanics, and then try to figure out what settings are needed to actually deliver adequate tidal volume. And then from there, once you start with settings, you wanna monitor blood gases or transcutaneous CO2 to see if these settings are effective. So, you, you know, I, I use the analogy of on invasive ventilation, you would never intubate someone and then never check a blood gas to determine whether you have to change settings. So non-invasive ventilation should be thought of in the same exact way. Um, you know, if anything, we need to really pay more closely, close attention because not everyone tolerates the mask. There's oftentimes, you know, high leaks. And so uh, we really want to make sure that whatever settings we're starting with are actually effective in reducing PCO2. If they're ineffective, then you really want to adjust settings to increase tidal volume and minute ventilation. Whereas if the settings are effective in reducing PSCO2, then over time you can translate that over into VAPS, um, knowing what the estimated average delivered tidal volume is on the fixed bi-level settings that seem to be effective. So I've gone through this with the APPs on AD to really have kind of a stepwise approach um, for new starts of non-invasive ventilation or new titrations for NIV.
And so, you know, as I'm, um, you know, as I'm talking about kind of approaches to adjusting um, settings, I, I, this pressure time curve has always been a very helpful kind of pictorial view for how we might think about um, adjusting settings. So the tidal volume is really going to be proportional to the area under this curve. So it's not equal to it, but, you know, it gives you a good sense of what can potentially be adjusted in order to increase that tidal volume. And so it's really just things that will increase that um, area under that curve. So I, oftentimes we think about increasing the IPAP, which is certainly one of the uh, main approaches, but also think about ways that inspiratory time rise. Um, and then also the, the last thing to think about in um, non-invasive ventilation is the way that EPAP, EPAP affects tidal volume, because once you're um, not intubated and you're dealing with non-invasive ventilation, obstruction can decrease uh, the tidal volume as well. So sometimes if someone's having obstructive events, you may have to increase the EPAP actually to get adequate tidal volume delivery. So thinking about all of that in real time to think about what are the best um, approaches to try to increase that minute ventilation. And so one final thing about non-invasive ventilation, um, really nothing in terms of settings is, um, it's all a moot point if the mask isn't fitting right. So if it's all leaking or the patient's not tolerating it, um, that's going to be the first step to making sure that you can ventilate someone adequately. So the respiratory therapist can be very helpful for providing different masks, um, but just know that there are a million different masks out there these days. And so um, sometimes, um, you know, just having a nasal mask might be better for someone who's very claustrophobic. So really troubleshooting that first. And again, we are lucky here at Michigan Medicine that we use a lot of transcutaneous CO2. So always think about that as a tool for patients that you want to monitor on non-invasive ventilation who are extremely hypercapnic because hypoventilation can be very, um, can just kind of sneak up on you. And it's not until someone's obtunded that you realize that they're acidotic and, you know, more hypercapnic. So think about using transcutaneous CO2 just the same way that we use uh, pulse oximetry um, and respond to that particularly for patients who are maybe spending, you know, several hours off of non-invasive ventilation, just to make sure that we know exactly um, when they need to go back on or if, if settings need to be adjusted. So as I go back to the case, um, you know, so this was a patient that really surprised me in terms of how quickly his PCO2 rose after he got extubated. And so that was really a sign to me of like total body CO2 storage. It wasn't just that he was hypoventilating again. It was actually that we were able to get PCO, his PCO2 down out of his blood, but his whole body still saturated with uh, his CO2 stores. So, you know, really be mindful of that. That's, you know, that's really been something that I've been more um, just attuned to over the last couple of years um, as we've published our data. Also, his, uh, his hypercapnia was multifactorial. So we did end up getting spirometry on him, and he did have COPD. Um, but he also was obese. He likely has OSA and has diastolic heart failure. So I think that just tells you, again, that no one fits into these you know, clean little boxes in terms of etiologies of respiratory failure. And so it actually took almost 24-7 NIV prior to discharge. Um, to actually keep the CO2 from, from climbing. And so again, I think that's another sign um, that, you know, we can't think about non-invasive ventilation as just this nighttime thing. You know, there are some patients who may require NIV for 12, 14, 16, sometimes even 24 hours in cases of extreme neuromuscular weakness to really um, flush out all those CO2 stores. So we discharged him on an ABAPS AE setting for sleep, but then used a bi-level um, PCAC mode for daytime use with a nasal pillow. And the reason why I chose this uh, time-cycled mode was just because of his obesity, just thinking that if he had a little bit more inspiratory time, that could overcome kind of his um, chest wall weight. Um, and then upon follow-up, when I saw him in two months after discharge, his PCO2 on transcutaneous is down to 49 and then five months later, down to 46. So if we think about, again, mortality difference um, from his baseline of, say, like 70 or six, high 60s, um, really starts to flatten out that uh, mortality curve. 
Um, and now he's able to use his uh, NIV just at night with his nighttime settings.